Hi everyone, so I'd like to introduce David Clive Price, who'll be speaking on the show today. He's a mental well-being mentor, he's a CEO and life coach, he's the author of The Hidden Demons Method, he's a keynote speaker, and he's an inspirational podcast guest. And that's just the tagline on his LinkedIn profile. And I was very impressed actually to find he'd written many books i think about 10 books on uh, on amazon so it's a very prolific author and uh, you know some people just do a lot of extracts from um their talks and call them books but he actually you know wrote them the old-fashioned way with a word processor so very impressive and so in the first half of the show he talks a lot about his um business experience in asia about um what he learned about dealing with other cultures and so on and in the second half he talks about his own personal journey and the struggles he had first of all uh, the difficulties he had coming out as gay in the late 60s and early 70s and also his alcoholism and depression and his struggles with that and how he uh how he managed to 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 go through that uh, to, to the other side so and also to uh, how he now helps others who are going through similar uh well well any problem really with the sort of hidden demons so it's a very sort of personal uh, interview and i uh, hope you find it very interesting uh, to start off to introduce myself um i'm david clive price um a global leadership and life coach um and I help entrepreneurs and professionals overcome mental health challenges such as fear, anxiety, and addiction so that they can face their hidden demons and create a more abundant life and business. So that's the title of my new book, Hidden Demons. Okay. So I was born in South London to Welsh parents. I graduated from Cambridge. Uh, with a PhD in Renaissance history. Okay. Uh, and then I won a British Academy Fellowship to, to study and lecture uh, at Bologna University. And I wrote my first books there uh, when living as a farmer, translator, academic in uh, the Tuscan countryside. So a fairly mixed start to life, um, kind of academic, uh, definitely interested in history and then definitely interested in Italy and other cultures. So my first partner came from Switzerland. Okay. So uh, uh, I spent quite a lot of time in, in Europe and, and in Switzerland in particular uh, for about six years. Uh, I then moved to Japan um, and spent a year there writing my first, my first travel book about Japan. Um, and I went on to st uh, study Asian, different Asian cultures and write a few books about them. So was that in Tokyo? Uh, yeah, I started off in Tokyo. Uh, I lived there for a year. Okay. I found uh, Japan quite difficult, actually. Well, um, why did you find it difficult? Uh, because... Uh, <clears throat> well, in Italy, I've been able to speak the language properly right. and, uh, you know, was working in a daily life together with other, like, country people, farmers, uh, and, mm. uh, you know, the, the people at the market and all this kind of thing. So you're kind of integrated into daily life and you, you learn language kind of on the go. Where in Japan, it was like, you know, I had my set phrases um, I tried to improve them. I tried to improve my Japanese, but it was difficult because you, there's a whole set of honorifics, they're called, the ways to yes. address people of different generations. And, I, I used to and work ages. for Japanese. Uh, I used to work for a Japanese company. I used to oh, work there you Canon, go. Uh, Canon headquarters. Oh, Canon. Euro European headquarters in Amsterdam. Oh, but, cool. uh, they did fly, uh, they did fly us out once to Japan uh, oh. for a meeting. But it was, yes, it's, I mean, the language is, uh, is extremely difficult. You can tell that by the fact that they tend to speak English not very well mm -hmm. compared to uh, Europeans. Yeah, and it's sometimes difficult to get through the different uh, kind of politenesses, if you like. Japanese is extremely polite. Yes, because uh, I worked but, there for two years. <coughs> right. And they never called me by my first name. They never called me Keith. There yeah, you were with Sam. Greek Sam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
I find it either kind of stiff and on the, on the other hand, I just love Japanese culture and um, the temples. I was interested in Buddhism and yeah. uh, all those kind of things really got me. But I got kind of lonely there. Um, and then friends suggested I move to uh, Hong Kong, which is much more international, they said. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was a bit wary because it's like a, a colonial, it was a colonial possession at that time. So I thought, oh, this isn't really ex exploring other countries and cultures. This is going back into being Brit British again. But I persevered and I met somebody at the airport who I then hitched up with for the next 34 years. Wow. Um, and still together with uh, Hong Kong Chinese. And so wow. I entered to kind of, I lived together with a Hong Kong family in, uh, first of all, in a public housing estate. And then finally we started to get organized and, Eventually, <clears throat> because of my writing background, my PhD, etc., I got a position, uh, offered a position at uh, HSBC um, as the chief speechwriter for the handover of Hong Kong to China. Oh, okay. So, so I that spent, was was that twenty years ago? Yeah, nineteen ninety seven. So nineteen ninety three to ninety eight, I was at uh, HSBC okay, in Hong Kong. Yeah. So that was a very interesting time. I remember the the handover. Chris Patton was uh, in charge, yeah. wasn't he? I remember his speech. Yeah, that's right. And it rained a lot. Right. Um, <laughs> and I remember the Royal Yacht Britannia coming into the <laughs> to the harbour. That was all very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, my taxi was kind of driving alongside it as it came in. So yeah, we were kind of living in in the middle of uh, of interesting times there. Mm. Um, and, but. Um, you know, corporate life didn't suit me entirely. Uh, mm. And after I'd done my big stint, I uh, set up my own company at yeah. HSBC and set up kind of advising different Asian multinationals to start with CEOs, advisors, uh, and doing strategic kind of communications, that kind of thing. Um, and slowly uh, developed my coaching practice, first of all, advising senior executives and then coaching uh, and set up uh, an extension of my Hong Kong company then in London, uh, which is now the basis of my uh, own global coaching, DCP okay. Global Coaching. Um, yeah. And I wrote uh, two le business leadership books more uh, in 2017, 18, one called Bamboo Stroll, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, Cultural Intelligence Secrets to Succeed in the New Global Economy. Um, and it's all about uh, developing cultural intelligence for working together with people of many different backgrounds and differences. And uh, I'll just pull it up as you're speaking. About it. I'll, I'll, I'll just pull it up on the screen. Uh, oh, cool. So, yes. uh, or I know some people might be listening to this as a podcast, but some might be watching it on uh, YouTube or Facebook. So, um, okay. <laughs> so this is called. Bamboo Strong, you're talking about cultural intelligence secrets to succeed in the new global economy. Yeah, you got it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Latest and so, what's this, so, so if you were to summarize in like a few sentences, what, what, what's this book about? Well, it says it's, it's a, bit, a book about uh, not about leadership theory or anything like that. It's about um, leadership in action, working together with people of many different of many differences um, mm. and different backgrounds, generations, uh, yeah. ethnicities, uh, creeds, etc., um, across all kinds of boundaries, uh, which are necessary uh, to 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 cross and to to thrive in and excel in in this very uh, globalized world. And of course, ba really bamboo is associated with China, or I associated with China, and of course, cool. you had a long time in in Hong Kong. So yeah. I imagine that uh, a lot of it refers to your experience or... Yeah, and I love the bamboo. Period. I love the bamboo groves in Japan as well. And right. in other, other parts of Asia. But the big thing about bamboo is the fastest growing plant on Earth. Okay. Uh, gra grass on Earth. And at the same time, it's incredibly flexible. Both fast growing, strong and incredibly mm. flexible. Which yeah. is the kind of qualities in leaders that I try to, um, to bring, bring out in this book. Um, which is again right. about my travels around the world. It's so is it, of, is it particularly um, directed towards people who are sort of doing business with China? 
would you say? Or not, spe not specifically with China. I have another book called The Master Key to China, which is about that. Okay. Um, but uh, no, specifically, this is more like a global global cultural intelligence of dealing with people of many different backgrounds. I've just have, I've just gone to your countries. I've just gone to your author page. You've done uh, a lot of books: <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> Chinese right. Rules, Phoenix Rising, A Journey to South Korea, uh, The Scent of India. Alphabet City, which what's the Alphabet City? Yeah, that was my first novel set in oh, New York. Oh, it's a novel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Which came out. And then there's the Master Key to Asia. Master you Key can to Asia, Six Step side, Guide though. to Unlocking New Markets. Wow. And uh, so to write the, did you literally just sort of sit down with a word processor and just <laughs> type away and and type them that way, or were they, or were they extracts from speeches, uh, transcriptions from there? Definitely not extracts from speeches. No, you wrote, you uh, wrote them all the old. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't way. using up my own material. Okay. Um, no, they're, they're large, all of them really, in one way or another, are narratives. So I write from personal experience. Okay, uh, so they're story, they're the story of your own. And I create a framework as I'm going. I mean, yes. one of the frameworks with, uh, I already had given to me for Bamboo Strong, that is a scholarly research framework uh, from the Institute of Cultural Intelligence in the, in the States. Um, so that's called the CQ model. But uh, the others I've developed my own models for, the Master Key to Asia and China, etc. cetera. Yeah. And the age of, age of pluralism, their global intelligence for emerging leaders, that's um, a synthesis of three frameworks, Bamboo Strong, uh, intelligent leadership uh, coaching program, which is pretty worldwide known, uh, and something called Global Disc, which is uh, an assessment for and uh, a behavioral um, method for. I've heard of uh, Disc, yes, because yes. I interviewed someone yeah. the other week who was skilled in uh, the Disc. Yeah, right. Well, this is this is the global version of it then. Okay. Yes, I know there's different versions of it. Yeah. So I've... wow, you have written a lot of books. Yeah, some of them out of print now, as you can see. But uh, okay. I think there's about 15. Wow. So I like writing books. That's one thing I definitely can so do. So the, the out of print ones, you could easily just republish, couldn't you? On a print on demand basis. Oh, that's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't got around to it, but yeah, it's true. Around, yeah. Yeah. The, especially the, the one on the Fib Forbidden City in Beijing, for example, that could be republished. Oh, that's and, Beijing, is it? Okay. Yeah, and yeah. travels in Japan. That's my early experience. I like the idea of weaving in, um, you know, story with when you talk about fact. It just makes it more engaging, I suppose, and makes it easier to link all the parts together. Yes, and I don't think I'd be able to write them from a kind of scientific or, what should we say, uh, academic uh, speak kind of, or corporate speak, or um, I, I'm not, I, my mind doesn't work like that. Um, yes. So therefore, I, I need the personal, the personal entree, the, the way in um, through, okay. through personal experience. Um, and of course, these are all a bit explorer books too. So there's part of me that, that likes being an explorer, where I like different languages. Yeah. I love, I love different cultures. So. And that's what I try to teach in Bamboo Strong, etc. is uh, this curiosity and this uh, readiness to explore and to have more than one viewpoint in mind at the same time, which in these days of political tribalism, uh, or tribalism of different sorts, is, is quite tough, but it's very necessary. Um, even yes, because we, we tend to get blinkered, don't we, in our own ideas, and we don't yeah. get into anything else. And I know that, um, well, when I was 20, well, when I was 24, I was actually, as soon as I qualified as an accountant, the first thing I did was to pack in my job and I went traveling around India, backpacking. Great. And I found that a uh, really, um, well, mind opening experience just to see how other people lived. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And also to see how happy they were really compared with how we were, even though they sort of had yeah. nothing. Very good point. Yeah. That's, I discovered very much in Asia. Um, and living together with people that, with the most simple means, like I was in, in a hut on the river Irrawaddy in, in Burma, or, yeah. uh, you know, um, on a housing estate in, in Kowloon, or, or wherever it was, um, just living very simply often, um, which reminds me now of these 
these recent times have reminded me, you know, of living with self-sufficiency. Yes. As I also did on the farm in Italy. Right. In the early 70s, <laughs> um, you know, that was kind of uh, the, the time of miners' strikes and uh, oh, three-day yes. weeks and all that kind of thing and a recession. Yeah, yeah. So um, living, the, the, the great ideal for young people then was to really go and uh, be self-sufficient to live on a, in a kind of commune. Um, That's right, yes. Yes. Yeah, some people went off to kibbutz in Israel. Yeah, that's right. Yes, a few of my friends. And I was very pr proud of my vegetables and tomatoes and uh, wine and olives. <laughs> that's right. Yes, and of course, there's a TV show, The Good Life, which um, oh yeah, which exactly. was based, based on that idea. Good people, yeah, and with, uh, which is maybe idea. coming back again now. I saw a recent article in the I think it was the Times or Guardian today about the the suburbs coming back. Um, I think I think a lot of people have this idea. Well, they find the corporate lifestyle unsatisfying in some way, or they yeah. find stressful, and they yearn for a sort of simpler life, a sort of downsizing. I think that. Well, they probably didn't know it was there until they were forced to. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to, to take the plunge because you know it's quite scary, yes. and um, it is hard to. Uh, and now people have refound family life, and that. Uh, yeah. You can share the, the children's duties and all that kind of thing and take little walks in nature and have your own little garden. And so out of these books, which is the, the best seller, would you say? Uh, well, Bamboo Strong on the, on the business side was, was the best seller. Oh, really? Uh, and on the, well, the fiction side, then, then Alphabet City was uh, in the early okay. 80s. Yeah. As his so, marriage disintegrates in a welter of suspicious and accusation, he discovers a homosexual identity of which he was previously unaware, tries to escape his past and recreate his identity. Yeah, so it's a very sort of gripping uh, plot. <coughs> Could make a good show uh, if it's turned into a film or something. Well, yes, there was even some talk about that. Oh, really? You might try to come back to it. <laughs> because it's a coming out story of an English academic who, who's, you know, as different escapes uh, being trapped in the marriage in the UK and, get, and escapes to New York and hitches yes. up with a uh, black painter. Right. Um, and then the daredevil um, kind of uh, uh, pursuit across the, the States to Las Vegas and back to New York. Okay. So it's, I should think that's sort of may make a good movie. And, uh, so are you, um, so your main way of communicating your ideas in the past it's been books is it still books or do you do more sort of videos or uh audios uh well i'm what i'm some of these books have audio yeah audio audio books. versions of the book yes, yes. But, i mean uh, do you do uh, now you, you still focus i'm thinking nowadays you know in 2020 people yeah. are doing more and more video which i i mean i Think is a much better medium because it you can see all the body language engages the emotions engages the internet yeah and, uh, well I, i've uh, produced uh, online courses now for two of my most recent programs and books okay so for bamboo strong there's an online course and also for hidden demons the the latest book there's an online course oh too. okay oh that's interesting because i i had a look at your uh well I started from your <coughs> LinkedIn profile and I looked at your contact info and I looked at your three websites and um, I was just trying to find out what you were doing. So this is, uh, so this Hidden first Demons. page, Hidden Demons, so this is about your latest book. Yeah, that's right. So this is, uh, 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 so, okay, and this promotes your coaching um, yeah. service, relationship coaching, life and crisis coaching, and career and business coaching. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and it's inviting people to uh, book a call with you. Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, the map of San Francisco, that's just incorrect. <laughs> that's <laughs> not just San Francisco. Not, not something I could get, get rid of. Um, okay. <laughs> it seemed, seemed to be there in the software, and I thought, well, what the heck? It's, yes, uh, it's a map to... San Francisco. Well, I'm sure it must be. Because, because you've got Jeff, Japan there as well, and the uh, Buddha. So why not okay. San Francisco, right? Yes, 
so this okay so this page i see it's got other pages to do oh courses okay yeah, i was going to say you courses, don't, yeah you have to sort of hunt it because i looked i spent uh some minutes looking around at these things and i wasn't particularly aware of the course you see some people put the course right at the beginning so people are aware yeah. of them but you for people might stumble across it i suppose uh Later. Yes, I, sh I should maybe have them more up front now on the website. I would, um, yeah. I mean, do you have like a sort of e email list or something? Yes. Yes. But uh, they should, as, as you say, they should be more front and centre. And also on my other website, my global leadership website. Oh, it's there. Um, yeah, that's coming soon. This, so this is uh, this is your coaching page and then how Yes. This is this on, th yeah, this is on davidcloudprice.com. Yes. So the online courses, therefore, would be under. Yeah, so like this, you've got you've got videos here. Um, yes. In your uh, a more purposeful life lies beyond. Uh, yeah. And how to build resilience in times of crisis. So was that video done as a response to the COVID crisis? Yes, and as part of the programs with the Hidden Demons book, and there's the online courses. Well-being course. And, and there's the well-being course, course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Develop the mindset, habits, and perspective needed to stay centred, focused, healthy, and strong in all environments. Yeah, yeah. it's obviously extremely important um, about self-taught. And, uh, yeah, so that's offered at 47 pounds yes which is like a sort of series of videos is it uh yes it's videos audio stories um okay. quizzes uh, exercises um worksheets uh and uh, books examples from books and then you offer half day um yeah for a half day this is one to one this is one to one yes okay i offer a half day and a full day yeah. Uh, sounds good. Uh, and now, because I looked, <laughs> I looked at all these sites, and I thought I was curious about if you have any social media where your social media channels are, and I didn't really come across them because they're not. I don't think. Well, you mentioned your Twitter in your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. But, um, and, uh, but I looked on your website and didn't really see anything. But then I think on one of these pages, I think on your blog, in the top yeah. right-hand corner, it's got links to your YouTube channel, Facebook, uh, and Twitter again. And then I go to your YouTube page, and I was amazed to find you've done all these, um, all these videos, some of, well, one of which has got 1,700 views. Right. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a well, well, I think it's a well-kept secret. I mean, yes. I think I think these videos Asian are not, business secrets. Yes, <laughs> all right. It's secret videos about secrets, but no, I would have. <clears throat> I think I think definitely these should be more prominent on your on your website because. Well, these have all grown from the um, from the original gestation of the the coaching. So, because I started off in Asia, um, yes, <laughs> and with uh, two books on Master Key to Ch China, Master Key to Asia, then there are a whole series of how-to videos that went with it um, and also speaking yes. that, go, that went with it. Um, but, it, you know, I've developed um, my program since then to be on one hand more global and now more recently to be more to do with resilience in itself. Uh, yes. Particularly for this current crisis. So, yes, I mean, uh, it's all there. Um, maybe I could highlight it more. I would definitely highlight, yeah, because people, well, I was sort of unaware, really. And yes. I, I stumbled across these, these links in the top of your blog page. Uh, I mean, your blog page looks very, um, you know, interesting as well. Lots of mm. um, great articles. Uh, and then you've got a Facebook page, which does that, which you're quite active on, aren't you? But you are... Uh, you just basically link to, let's see what that links to. Oh, it links to your blog posts, basically. So you're posting your articles and yes. uh, probably videos onto your Facebook page. Yeah, that's right. A, a yeah. bit of engagement to them as well. 
So a few more of the videos could go back into Facebook. Um, uh, yes. And maybe yeah. onto LinkedIn as well. Um, well, LinkedIn's got a 10 minute um, limit, hasn't it? But you could yeah. post the, the YouTube link well, on the LinkedIn ooh. and then... Uh, yeah, most of mine are under 10 minutes anyway. Are they? Okay, yes. yes. Yeah, because yes. you, you, you cut them up, obviously, yeah. for the, a longer talk. And Seven, then, uh, five... Yeah, it's three minutes, two minutes, yeah. Which Seven, is five, size. two, yeah, bite size, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. So do you, have you posted these onto LinkedIn? Uh, I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and there must have been in the, in the, I mean, it's quite a long time ago, but yeah, they must have been. Because you, 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 yeah, you could rotate them you, sort of every three months, you know, you could put them up again. Yeah, good point, Keith. Yeah. yeah, people would be interested in that, wouldn't they? Intercultural they leadership will. in a globalised world. Yes. Um, mm, good, good thinking. Also, um, you can take, um, you could repurpose the content, which uh, also is something, you know, a service that I'm getting into providing, which is if you, from a video, um, yeah. you can... Um, if you go through it, you might find like one sentence which yeah. summarizes like the light bulb moment, and then you put that on a sort of quote card and then use that as a static image because a lot of times people haven't got the time to look at a video, but as they're scrolling through the feed, then they just see the um, you know the insight uh, there on the yes. feed. So, uh, so that's another great thing to do. Uh, that's a, another great tip, yeah, because <laughs> with that, of course, it works very well on. LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, and Twitter, and Instagram. But I don't think you're. That's not where your demographic, target demographic is. So you wouldn't bother with Instagram. Um, yeah. So it read so a video. You'd repurpose as um, uh, like a quote card, or you could also. I mean, these are already quite short. If it was a longer video, like half hour one, you could just take a little snippet, which you've sort of already done. I suppose to get these. Yes. Um, so you're, you're suggesting take, just taking a kind of a snapshot of, of one, one image from the video and putting a quote on it. Well, right? well, you find a quote, like one sentence, yes. like the pearl of wisdom in this video. Yeah. And yeah. then you can just, uh, you can create a graphic image. You can use the software called Canva, which is great. Yeah, I'm using that. Yes. You're using that. Yeah, yes. it's a great, really nice quote card for that. Have your your logo, your website, and then the, 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 the quote in the middle. Uh, oh, yeah, I could do that. Yes, yeah, yeah very much so. Mm. Nice. And yeah, and then um, good advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so many things then, that we don't see ourselves. So know, many things you don't see yourselves, and then yeah. also, I mean, I don't know if all of these you've turned into blog articles as well. Yes, you have basically. Yeah. So you're already yeah. repurposing it in that way. So you've got video yeah. and audio. Yes. And you, but you don't have a podcast, do you, as such? Because that's another. Well, I you, I do have an Asian Business Network podcast, but I haven't. It's, I haven't uh, used it for a long time. It's not linked to here from anywhere, is it? No. So what which should I search for to find that? Well, probably Asia Business Network podcast. Try. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it's number three on uh, podcast and Apple Podcasts. Yeah, so it's about uh, just over a year ago was your last. Yeah. Some one second. <laughs> some of these are one second long. I don't How know how I managed there. that. Maybe it didn't I don't know. load properly. God. Yeah, I'll delete. Yes, yes, I'll delete them. But you've got. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I've well, got ninety percent of one. Yes, you've got I'll some see. five star reviews, so they can't all be one second. Isn't that weird? Yeah, something went wrong in the process of loading. It them. might be. Did you do it to? Did you originally upload to an aggregator and then it re-uploaded here? Maybe use another service. Um, mm -hmm. Some some of them might have gone there as well. Yeah. But the last one looks quite good. An agile leader is like a conductor, uh, fifty-four minutes, so seventy episodes. I think mm. the the sort of the subject matter that you're talking about, I think it works very well on podcast because it's the sort of thing. If I was, I love listening to podcasts because it's the sort of thing I do when I can go for a walk or if I'm you know lying in bed relaxing or trying to sleep or something, I might put a podcast on. So, uh, 
uh, I, yeah, I think it'd be great to put your longer talks on onto podcasts. Right. Yeah. So, what would you say is so you're doing a lot of things? So you've got these, you've got lots of views on your YouTube oh, channel. You're please. quite active. Sorry, can I ask just one yeah. question? Yeah. Is it easy for me to change the name of it so that it's like uh, I don't know, International Business Network podcast or something? Yes, I think. Well, it depends. Yes, I think it is. Because are you? Did you upload this to Apple directly, or did you? Because I use a service called Anchor FM. Do you, do you know about Anchor FM? No, not so much. Okay, well, if you, um, I know because I changed the the name of my podcast. Ah, okay, so it's easy. So if you go to this, um, where the, this this uh, interview will actually be, I'll upload it to here, uh, yeah. probably tomorrow or something. Anchor.fm, and then uh, you can easily. You know, this is called the Start of Show with Keith Briggs. It used to be called the Keith Briggs Show. You can right. just go in there, click, and then you can just edit the podcast name. And then this uh, syndicates to many different services, including um, Apple, Stitcher, and uh, all the, uh, Spotify oh. and all the other and it, great podcast things. And, and this called, is this is the free one. This is the free one. Uh, there are other page services which are better as well, which I'll probably migrate to at some point. Right. Um, Anchor.fm. Yeah, yeah. podcast a uh, dashboard well just anchor to fm and then it will redirect once ah. you create an account it redirects to that yeah it's completely free it's just very easy to use but that's amazing yeah, yeah. so i could change the name of it and uh yes well yeah, the problem is you'd have to try and i i don't know how these got here but you might have to somehow import this into anchor.fm hmm. uh but if you've got all the audio, you can always just delete this and just start again if that's the yes. easiest way of doing it. Yeah, looks nice. Okay, so you've got many different um, tentacles in different places, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, you've got podcasts, you've got all these books, and uh, Facebook as well. So what would you say is your, your biggest and best source for new uh, clients? Let's say uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, um, yes. Yeah. That's the. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm finding that as well for my clients as well. It's. Um, it took me a while to appreciate LinkedIn because at first mm. it just seemed to a lot of people trying to sell me stuff all the time, but uh, actually I found it a, a really great place to, to meet people, and of course we actually met on LinkedIn as well. That's right. So how do you? Um, so so how do you? meet potential clients on, on LinkedIn? What, what's your process for uh, well, yourself or connecting with people? Yeah, um, I connect with them. Um, I have a target audience. Um, Who is recently, your target dem demographic? Well, m more recently, the target demographic, as if you can see the rainbow down there at the bottom, rainbow flag, I've... Uh, it's also Gay Pride Month, so, so I've um, been well, targeting LGBTQ professionals. How can um, you, you just search for that phrase as a keyword? Uh, just uh, LGBT or yeah. LGBTQ, and it comes up. Comes yes. up with about, uh, if you narrow it down to a country, then it's, you know, UK and US is like, uh, I don't know, like a, a thousand or so, or 1500 or, or whatever. Yeah. So these are your tier two um, connections who are who yes. have that who, yes. who would have that um, acronym in their profile. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've you know, I've had broader demographics, and I've uh, been using pharmaceutical and biotech companies, for example, as another one. Um, okay. So that was a a large network, very large network, um, but difficult to talk to. Uh, whereas uh, this is a target audience which happens to coincide also their priorities and concerns very much coincide with the latest book. So, Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so this is where you're so hitting. I was going trying. to say, it, what, I was trying to think of the connection between that and doing business in Asia yeah. and so on, but it's not. Well, yeah, but that's why their business in Asia and China yes. are rather slightly left behind because, yes. uh, you know, I've moved on. 
Um, although I, you're quite right, I should be using some of that expertise and getting it back out there. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so my, my thinking and my uh, whole passion has moved towards uh, not, you know, not the first five steps of doing business in, in the Philippines and Thailand, but uh, into um, intercultural leadership and into um, uh, mental resilience um, and uh, mental health challenges. Yes. So that's my current uh, passion um, for Is helping. It, because you're quite open in your profile, aren't you, on LinkedIn about your um, various struggles you've had yeah. over the years. Yes. So do you want to just talk, talk me, me through that? Um, well, yeah. Well, I, as I've spoken, as I've explained earlier, I started off as a, as a writer and academic at the age of 21. Yes. Um, but with a tendency to uh, drink too much alcohol. Um, right. Even at that age, I was kind of, although I was very specialised, I mean, I, I sang in the college choir and um, I did my PhD. So obviously I was very functioning, but yes. uh, obviously I had a tendency towards that, perhaps from my earlier, you know, uh, relations with my uh, Welsh cousins and going out with the rugby boys when I was 14 and being fed cider and things like that, whatever it was. Well, I think a lot of, I mean, the drinking culture is yes. so prevalent in, yes. in, in student circles. I used to be an extremely heavy drinker when I was a student. There you go. Well, everybody yeah. was in yeah. Cambridge, really. Yeah. So I didn't stick out as anything weird or no. abnormal. Um, but I did have some underlying uh, cause for unease, I guess, because of being gay. So um, some difficulties. Which probably at that out. time, I mean, nowadays people yeah. might say, you know, being gay, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Yes. But back in those days, it was very different, wasn't it? Yeah, even now it can be tough for many. But yeah. then it was definitely, you know, it was a closed club, really. 1969, 1967, I went up to college. So 67 was the same year that it became yeah, it was decriminalized, wasn't it? So-called decriminalized, yeah, it yeah. wasn't really. So no. half decriminalized. Yeah. So it was still a little closet club, even at college. Uh, you just met in some Don's rooms and uh, drank too much wine, basically. And that was it. Yeah. Um, and it was very difficult to come to terms with. So first yeah. of all, you had to go through the process of coming out to your parents and then, yes. you know, were they going to be enormously disappointed because you... you know, you're doing a PhD and you're going to have a good position in society and they are too going to feel good and look good and then you come out with that right so it worked I mean yeah. they came to accept it but I had to go I mean I I, I, I didn't find a, a partner and in, in the UK I somehow only when I met someone from Switzerland did I you know I went over to Switzerland really to yes. my gay life yeah, yeah. Um, and it, and that was so-called respectable, you know, is a good person of good background and et cetera, et cetera. So that worked from that point of view, but still me always tippling um, yes. and, and sometimes more than tippling. So yeah. no, there were achievements and there were books, um, but there, this was a kind of recurrent uh, depression or whatever it was or anxiety. That's, that's oh okay so you okay so you'd um sort of come out as gay yeah and you're in a relationship with someone in switzerland yeah you're still um you're consuming alcohol on a regular basis yeah and then you and then you, you this depression did that sort of slowly sort of start or was yes that, that, that started to kind of become more apparent um, yeah even as in, in many ways i was happy in 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 italy by then we bought a farm I'd done my research fellowship at Bologna. I, we bought a farm at very yeah. cheaply and I was working the land, etc. But still drinking my own vino, which right. was quite, quite light, but you start early yes. in the morning, right? So, yeah, um, it creeps up on you. Anyway. Yeah. So, and I felt quite isolated because my other half was mainly in Switzerland running a film festival and yes. I was there kind of uh, being a half writer, half farmer, etc. Yeah. So anyway, we eventually split up. The, the idyll came to an end, and um, my my partner suggested I try try Asia, since I was so interested in other cultures. Right. And that's that's when I went over to to Japan. Okay. 
and then I became even more isolated. Um, well, of course, because of as we were talking yes, about the language barrier, right. the cultural barriers. So. Yeah, so I end up flat on my back, kind of every morning, waking up, no, knowing, not knowing what I was doing on the on the kitchen floor. Um, right. And you know, I fortunately had one or two friends there of my previous partner who helped me go we, to we, AA. That was us from drinking more and more heavily. Yes. Yes. And like every night going out. So, yeah, yeah. and not even with the expatriates, sometimes with the Japanese who I couldn't communicate with, except that we drank a lot of sake. So, and yes, because I think um, the Japanese <laughs> culture, I think, um, especially for the men, it's they're not yeah. very good at expressing emotions and so on. That's after, right. Yes, a lot of them are heavy drinkers as well. Until 11 o'clock at night, and then yeah, they fall yeah. down in their best clothes on the you know, underground That's right, yeah. in Tokyo. So, uh, yeah, and then, I mean, my, my first partner was extremely good. He, he advised me to then try Hong Kong. Uh, and then I told, you know, I told you the story of um, meeting... Uh, Met someone at the airport. Yes, at the airport, yes. who's, who's been my partner now for 34 years. So I've been yes. incredibly lucky. And, of course, that sobered me up. Um, finally, he told me any more sake drink in the morning and we're not going to be together. So right. I, I went to Korea, I went to a, a temple to, to pray and I went and I spent three or four nights in one of those, you know, Korean Japanese type inns where you sleep on the floor. Um, okay. Doing cold turkey. And I think for, I've heard about, uh, I think I've heard about these places. Um, yeah. Uh, Asian Buddhist monasteries where it was yes. like I've got a, a detox program uh, for alcoholics and, yeah yeah well it, it wasn't specifically for that I just no. knew that I love this place so uh, this Buddha on the hill above uh, yes ancient Korean capital called Pyongju okay. uh, and I just went up there and uh, I just, just told myself this is it you can do it or you've had it mm. so went back and then I got my partner to come over. I was sober and then we started our life together. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a journey. 15 years then I was, I was sober. I was in, in this big bang. So would, would you, problem. would you recommend if someone is, does have alcohol problems, would you recommend that sort of extreme approach? You've gone yeah. cold Turkey to a place like that. And, cold Turkey. I would definitely yeah. say if you can yeah. make it and it's a matter of minutes, if you can make it the next five minutes, you, you oh, can make it the next ten. Yeah, yeah. You can make it one hour. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you throw up once. You can make it on and on and make sure yeah, yeah. all that stuff goes down the sink. Yes. And then you're trembling for two days, but uh, you're on the way back. Right. Um, but it's a slow process, step by step. Um, which is like, you know, coming back from depression and anxiety, as I, as I show in the life strategies in my book, um, that's also a process of step by step, one yes. day at a time, um, living in the present, yes. um, listening to your inner voices, finding out which ones are the hidden demons. Um, right. It takes time. Yes. Yeah, so when you say listen to your hidden voices, I was <laughs> my first response is, well, some of your hidden voices, yes, are demons. They're ones you shouldn't listen to. But what you're saying is you should become aware of them. And then I'm when aware you become of aware of them, you can choose. You have a choice, it, and then you exactly. can to listen to some. Yeah. So it means facing up to reality, or which means just becoming more conscious, basically, doesn't it? Becoming aware yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. And learning new habits because drinking or any other kind of addiction is a habit. Yeah. And it, in a sense, so is fear, so is anxiety. Yes. Uh, stress, etc. They're habits, and. They can be unlearned by the brain, does something yes. strange because it starts to learn one step at a time, two steps at a time, and suddenly you're in a new habit. And did so, you find did you find by uh, giving up alcohol that uh, also reduced your depression? hundred uh, percent. Well, 100%, I wouldn't yeah. say hundred percent. Not hundred percent because it, I did have relapse, but um, certainly 80 percent, shall we say, definitely. So the relapses were, were in depression or alcohol? Uh, no, more uh, to do with uh, the depression or, yes. or the anxiety, shall we say. Anxiety, yeah. Yes. Um, and, and, and then starting to tipple. I mean, you, tippling is very insidious. 
you, you know, you can have a glass of water and a little champagne in a glass yes. and drink them both together and think, ah, oh, that's fine, I'm all right, um, yeah, yeah. I can do that. And of course, that's just the beginning. Of, it is uh, the beginning. I mean, I, yeah. um, I, I, uh, I hardly ever drink nowadays, but I do mm -hmm. find sometimes if I just have one sip of wine, then yes. I have this really strong urge to just drink the whole glass, yes. and then I want yes. to drink the whole bottle. Yeah. So, so I find I don't even sip wine now because it's just better off. Um, yeah. But well, it's the same, unfortunately, with opioids and antidepressants. Yeah, and oh, but it's a massive problem, isn't it? Massive it's, problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and in the UK too. Um, well, with the antidepressants, yes. yes. But we don't have an opioid crisis. Crisis on the, on the scale of yeah. states now. Yeah. So uh, still, there's a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of dependency. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And unfortunately, with the current crisis, um, that dependency is likely to grow. And yes, a lot of people are. Apparently, the figures, problems, statistics are showing. Yeah. That yeah. So, uh, but the, the, the story of the book really is that I searched my way to, to self acceptance and overcoming isolation, overcoming alcoholism, and. Um, yeah, and my fear of coming out as a gay man and, yes. and finding my true love. So, yeah. yes, it's the story of my life, but it's the story of, of everybody's life coming out well, of, of course, adversity. Yes. We've yeah. all got some kind of <laughs> demon like that, haven't we? So, yes. Yeah. So it's how you can become your true self. And it's, I think it's quite hard without the support of others. I mean, I think you were very lucky yeah. to have this partner who uh, yes. gave you this yes. ultimatum uh, and that gave you the strength to sort of go through it because you realized oh. it was clear that this was the path towards health and happiness yes so, yeah. because many people with um, different versions of mental health challenges they they often feel secrecy or shame yeah. or embarrassment they didn't think it will affect their position at work or even in the family so they hide it um but the you know that's that's not the way to go you've got to find a support network you must yes. find people you can share with yes which could and be a group or it could be one person exactly or, it could be, or there could be someone like you for example because this i suppose is something you do in your coaching practice yes yeah yes absolutely mm. so there is a way back uh, but you need the support of other people and you need to be vulnerable and they may well have been in the same position themselves but certainly willing to share so yes. it is family friends work colleagues whoever support network is really important yeah yeah oh so it's interesting because you've got two to very different sides of your business or yes. one is with business in asia and then which all your books are about and then this is like a whole different tangent i suppose you're you're going off on, on this so this is uh but this one is related in the sense that um for the diversity that i talk about in the bamboo strong and plural age of pluralism yes diversity and agility uh, exploring curiosity different perspectives they are all related to what we do with our inner life um and where we where we find strength in resilience for example or where we build our resilience uh, they're the same kind of capabilities that we need to succeed across borders and cultures um, because it's to, different do, backgrounds. It's, it's to do with sort of up leveling your consciousness so just more aware yes or it could be that they're so more aware both of the hidden demon the demon the different voices within yourself some of which are demons and some of which is like more healing voices and in the same way become more conscious when you're working with other cultures of how are they different to how you are rather than yes. sort of yeah. carrying on the same unconscious way that we normally carry on Yes, and so upgrade your yeah your awareness um, and your getting on other people's wavelength and your own wavelengths and tuning them right. So, so is there is there like a sort of particular technique that you use to do that? Um, Something you just do. Well, uh, I, there, there's, <laughs> there are different <laughs> tips. There are kind of daily tips, sort of kinds daily of things tips. that you can do, like the. For example, um, a little habit of meditation or a yes. little habit of uh, a little prayer of gratitude yes. once or twice a day, 
however yeah. you do it, you don't have to pray to anyone in particular, but just yeah, yeah. put that out ahead. And and mm. thankfulness, gratitude is really gratitude, important. yeah. Um, for the support network, um, or for you know tuning yourself to to life, um, I think uh, joining a group of some sort, a choir, for example, um, yeah. or some activity that takes you out, but you're communal. Um, nature is incredibly healing um, yes the japanese as you i don't know if you know but they have a they have a practice called uh, uh, forest bathing okay um, i didn't know that yeah it's with <laughs> shin, shin ryoku shin ryoku okay. and i just love this idea and the japanese are always going on about nature and the spirits of nature and walking yeah, in nature. yeah. and they're right because that's exactly what we found out during this um this crisis is that uh, nature has been one healing thing that we can do. Oh, it's, definitely. It's, I love, I, I live in the countryside near lakes and uh, yes. Rivoli, and I really yeah. love uh, being in nature. Yeah, it's nature, great. nature breathes mm. and we can breathe with it. Right. Mm. Um, just walk amongst the trees. That was, uh, is already a help. So there are, there are various tips. There are many kinds of tips, but there, as a, as a long-term strategy or a process, then I think, you know, you have to analyze the story so that you tell yourself um, about your past, for example, maybe find the unconscious stories that are there. Like for me, it was perhaps my, my uh, not uh, living up to my parents' expectations, something like that. Um, yes. That I discovered that story only later. Yes. Um, asking for help, like with the support system, Yes. So changing your plans, revising your plans. Yeah. Taking one day at a time, living in the present. We're yes. so busy projecting everything onto the future. Yes. Or perhaps living in the past, but not taking the day as it's as it is. It's now. You can't change the past and you can't predict the future, right? Sure. So living in the present is really important. Building a support team, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, listening and observing and being curious about yes. yourself and about other people uh, while we're so busy having recourse to social media to give opinions that we're not listening observing or being curious right that's right yeah uh, we're not holding more than one viewpoint at the same time perspective is really difficult to get um, so um so you produce a lot of books, you've got these courses, you do one-to-one -one work. Do you do group work at all? Do you have any group coaching sessions or anything like that? Yes, the group coaching is just coming online now. So I'm just about to, to launch that program. And that um, would be on your website? If you that could. will be on the website, yeah. Which is um, that davidcliveprice.com. .com. Yes. Yeah. And also on hiddendemons.com. On the coaching on the page. Yes, yeah. yeah. So group coaching, yes. Um, so creating and finally the creating an action plan to to re-energize your life is really important. So yes. as, you, as you get, you know, to to readjust, um, to put uh, a real action plan into which is different for each place. person. So it's important yes. that you create yeah. it yourself. So you take exactly. So that's what we do. In the one-to-one um, -one session is create this action plan. Yeah. Yes. And then also with future coaching sessions, that gives some accountability as well. Yes, so that's right. Really yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. So that's very interesting. So in the future, do you think you'll be doing more of this sort of coaching or more like the hidden demon type coaching, or will you be more pursuing your sort of business, uh, Asian business ideas or? No, I'd be made more on the global, well, the global leadership and life coaching are related, as I, yes, as I say. Yes, they're related. So yeah, there's, there's different I won't be doing, I won't be, yeah, I won't be doing so much business etiquette for, for China no. or for, for, the, for Thailand. You're moving more into this sort of That's, feeling like depression. That was really a good experience, uh, but I've built on that since. So, yeah, I'm doing more in the, in is the that, life coaching. Is, is that... So what is the reason you're moved into that direction? Do you find it more satisfying or do you find it's a bigger market? Uh, well, 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 definitely uh, more satisfying. Yes. Um, 
because uh, you're not just giving etiquette tips. Um, I found that when I was uh, coaching business entry to different markets in Asia, for example, I tended to end up with people asking me tips. You yes. know, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you give a gift, etc.? Mm. Um, which is okay um, yeah. because then you could explain the, the mindset behind it and the beliefs. Yes. The beliefs are always interesting behind it, etc. The different ways of um, negotiating or thinking about time or uh, saving face or whatever it is. Um, but they they don't really take you very far inside. So. The global leadership did more with Bamboo Strong and I think the hidden demons uh, with my flagship program called Ascend the Mountain um, it w is taking is taking me, yeah, is, is more my passion right now. Yeah, well, that sounds great. And I noticed the cover of your hidden demons book has got someone uh, ascending, ascending, the ascending the mountain. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> Yeah, you're good to spot that. Yes. Goes, say, what's that person doing <laughs> in a blinding light? Um, well, it's a striking image, isn't it? So I'll yeah, just hopefully. the screen again, so in case uh, so people can see that. Uh, there you go. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a very striking image, yeah. And I suppose it's, uh, yeah, when you climb a mountain, it's so much effort, isn't it? And then when you finally get there, you feel all this relief because you finally yeah. achieved everything and no more struggle. And uh, that's the same feeling, I suppose, when you, you know, you've gone through this process and you've uh, got rid of your addiction and depression and uh, yeah. other things, yeah. And exhilaration and yeah. being being the real you, ready to live a abundant life and business yeah well we're coming up to the end of the the hour david so it's been uh, it's been lovely talking to you and it's been very um i've learned a lot about different no, I ideas to. to cope with my own sort of inner demons or destructive tendencies which you know i suppose we all have to some extent um yeah. so um yeah do you have any final words or anything before we go or well, um, leadership is to do with actions. Yes. Not words. Right. And signals, not demands. So as we move forward, it's what you do is so important. Yes, because we just think it's about consuming more knowledge, don't we? we yes. That's the answer. And then we, we yes. never change. So we've yes. got to make an effort. That's why we need this action plan need accountability and all those other things you mentioned and that yeah. is the way yeah. uh, forward you know, to change things and i've greatly enjoyed talking to you with a japanese screen in the background yes so i thought you might like that yeah. okay <laughs> well right, nice speaking to you david and you keith yes thank you for having me huh thank you for coming on it's been a real pleasure bye now you speak to you all. bye so i hope you enjoyed the show uh, i found it very interesting uh talking to david uh, because of the wealth of his uh, business experience in Asia and his uh, his desire to c communicate all the learnings he had about uh, working with different cultures and so on and to help people uh, sort of see things um, differently through other eyes and so on. And also an extension of that is uh, his own sort of personal story uh, about his struggle with his own inner demons and how he's also helping people to um, go, th you know, go through their own journey with their own demons by just sort of raising their consciousness really and uh, just seeing things more objectively as they really are rather than being sort of trapped in their smaller mindsets. Anyway, so uh, that's all for now. Hope to see you on the next show. Bye.